Inside Crime and the Faculty of International Studies of the University of Rosario. The event will be carried out in Spanish through Zoom and it will be broadcasted on Facebook Live in Spanish. To uh, listen to the event in English, you can uh, click on the uh, button for to, to select your language. On uh, also Twitter and Facebook and uh, social media. Everyone following the event can participate continuously with the hashtag Crimen Organizado Latam that you will find in the promotional images of the event and social media. The third international seminar is made of three panels which are available for the public through the same link of Zoom. The system is enabled so that you can enter, register and leave. I'll give the floor to the co-director of the Colombia Observation of Organized Crime, Aline Thickner and uh, Jeremy McDermott. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being with us in this annual seminar, the third we are holding for the uh, Colombian Observation of uh, Observatory. It's within the international uh, faculties of the uh, University of Rosario. From our uh, last uh, seminar, uh, many things has ha have happened in the world and in the organized crime on which we will have the opportunity to speak about during the day today, but uh, also the observatory, the Colombian Observatory has uh, had uh, progress and we will speak about the uh, progress we have had in the University of Rosario. We have uh, we have a new web page that will interact with the uh, Inside Crime that is in a process of uh, renovation and launching. We have made some new documents first on GLOBE that uh, monthly shows uh, the thought of experts and different uh, issues on organized crime, a series of work documents that uh, go deeper academically in specific facets of the crime, uh, drug dealing, <clears throat> and some other analysis and documents of a situation, all these with the help of a pool of students of research that kindly have joined us in the semester and in the future and also uh, postdoctoral extraordinary participants that have consolidated our work in the observatory for the seminar this year. It was easy and uh, difficult at the same time to select the axis to speak about at least the ones that are different from the uh, organized uh, crime affected by the pandemic that will be analyzed in the third uh, seminar today. So we have accepted to discuss two additional issues, the crisis in Venezuela and criminalization of Venezuela and the environmental crimes to consider that uh, these two are some of the most important ones that Amer Latin America is facing currently as we announce the three uh, groups that we are going to develop are um, separated so that uh, you can leave or enter without interruption. And briefly, we are going to start with our first uh, speaker panel of Venezuela. We appreciate you joining us today and all these three years. I appreciate uh, my um, partner, Jeremy McDermott, and I will give him the word now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arlene. Welcome everyone to our conference on organized crime in the Americas. My name is Jerry McDermott and with Steve Dogley, we are the uh, directors of Inside Crime. We are sad that we will not see many of you face to face this year, but with all the announcements uh, of vaccination for, we will pray for the next year to come back to normal. It has been a difficult year for everyone, even for the organized crime. 
Inside crime has seen itself limited in the research uh, investigation of field due to the crisis. Since uh, we cannot travel, we uh, trust our local investigators <clears throat> spread in the region to reach to the primary sources and keep the information source for our analysis on the trends, criminal trends of the region. Despite all of that, it has been a historical year for Inside Crime. We hold our uh, 10th anniversary and now we count on 50 employees in the region. And in Europe, since we are looking uh, to go deeper in the coverage and research and analysis of organized crime in the region, our appreciation to our partners of the University of Rosario it's been a spectacular collaboration and we hope <clears throat> it gets better in 2021. Enjoy the conference and please send us your comments and questions in the Zoom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeremy and Arlene. So this is the agenda today at nine up to 10.15 in the morning. We're going to have the first panel called Venezuela and the criminal entities at 11.15 and up to 12.30, we will have the second panel called environmental crimes at four and up to uh, 5.15, we will carry out the third panel called the uh, virus and uh, criminal entities at 5.15, we will have the closing of the event. We we'll remind you that in the end of each panel, we will have a space for uh, questions from the audience that you can ask through the chat in the Zoom platform or through our social media, Facebook and Twitter. To start our second panel, to the first panel, I'm sorry, we will start the first panel called Venezuela and the criminal entities. In the last years, the links have increased in between the organized crime and the different branches of power in Venezuela. The government of Nicolas Maduro has supported on uh, income, criminal income and uh, marginalized groups. So it's worth asking if the actors that control the economies are becoming part of the structures of power. This panel will be moderated by Francine Jacom, Executive Director of the Venezuela Institute of Social Studies. This uh, panel is made of Jeremy McDermott, Veronica Subillata, Wilfredo Cañizares, Nelson Bocananda. We appreciate Francine and the speakers, and we welcome the panel. We remind the participants that in the end, we will have a QA. Q&A session, so you can participate in the chat of the event or through Facebook and Twitter to um, listen to the event in English. You can activate uh, the uh, globe icon in Zoom. Thank you very much. Welcome. Good morning. Very happy to be here. We have to live this experience, unfortunately. I would like to appreciate the organizers for the invitation to participate in this panel, especially because they know very well the problems of internet that we can have here in Venezuela. This first panel, as you have seen, has a, a title like Venezuela and the um, criminal criminal gangs. So we uh, heard the first question about the criminal actors. They are becoming part of the government of Maduro while they uh, provide with um, criminal monies and they exercise a power. The second uh, question for the day to start the discussion is how these actors affect in the uh, border and uh, which are the dynamics, criminal dynamics. For this, we count on four experts in this area. Briefly, 
I will speak about that. Jeremy McDermott is co-founder and co-director of Inside Crime. He's a director of the working team located in the venue of the organization in Medellin, Colombia. And he has worked, of, he has experience for more than two years reporting in Latin America. Veronica Suyaga, is, she is a PhD in sociology by the University of Lovaina. And currently she's a professor and uh, investigator in the Simón Bolívar University in Caracas. She has been a visitor professor in uh, many universities in uh, abroad, and she founded, along with other uh, investigators, the Red of Activism and Investigation for Living. Director of the Progresar Foundation, uh, advocate of human rights and observer uh, in the uh, human rights observation. Nelson Bocaranda, he is a founder and editor in chief of Run Runes and the uh, Alianza Rebelde with uh, investigation journalism, dependent in uh, research, investigation journalism, a member of the board of the Venezuelan chapter of transparency. With this, we would like to give the floor to our speakers, uh, starting with Johnny. Thank you very much, Francine. I will share my screen. Listo. Espero que todos pueden ver eso. I hope all of you can see the screen. Nicolas Maduro has been for seven years in power. His government has been under sanctions from the United States since 2017. Nevertheless, he is still in power. In a president uh, of a failed state and a, a contracted economy, such conditions uh, would have uh, taken any president out, but he has kept in charge building a new structure of power in Venezuela. A link, political link that is criminal, that allows him to access uh, criminal monies, use irregular forces and paramilitary, either Venezuelan and Colombian to keep the territorial control and uh, clash against the opposition. He has created a series of criminal gangs in the country. But what do we understand by uh, criminal gangs? We, there are criminal uh, spaces and geographical spaces in Latin America where the government has no presence or little presence and the criminal control these territories, uh, assuming state roles like uh, security, charge, uh, taxes, and administer, manage justice. These are uh, criminal spots. Uh, criminal gang is where the criminal actors uh, act the same way, but with the blessing of the state, and they work jointly, frequently, with the state forces. We have identified 16 uh, criminal gangs in Venezuela in the territory where non-state actors or criminal gangs have uh, important exercise or domain of areas of the country where they act under the command or jointly with uh, Maduro's regime. The uh, rise of this uh, organized crime in Venezuela, independent and state crime, has uh, been de de determining. So the Cartel of the Los Soles, uh, dedicated to narcotraffic in the Maduro's regime, has transformed Venezuela from being a simple uh, transit nation to an important actor in the world of cocaine. The evolution, accelerated evolution of the organized crime in Venezuela, maybe 
is better uh, pictured with uh, the Tren de Aragua, uh, criminal federation of MIGA gangs led by the prison of Tocorón by Hector Guerrero Flores, alias Niño Guerrero. Despite an increasing presence in Venezuela, Tren de Aragua has a permanent presence in Colombia, Brazil, and Peru. Their criminal gang start with uh, the Tocorón jail that uh, is a fortress for Niño Guerrero, an operation base where he can operate with impunity and protected from the enemies um, in the outside world. The most powerful actor, the non-state uh, most powerful actor in Venezuela is the Colombian uh, ELN armed group. This group has experienced the growth either in Colombia and Venezuela as well. In Colombia, they have taken the power of uh, territory left by the FARC cousins after the peace accord in Venezuela. They have spread from their traditional bases to all along the border to to in uh, the end to the interior of Venezuela. Many, many times they have the blessing or invitation of elements of uh, Maduro's regime. That has enormous implications of security for both nations and the ELN. They recruit more Venezuelans. So there is no more time for the presentation. It is clear, the more time they stay in power, this Maduro's government, the stronger these criminal elements will become in the country and Venezuela's position as the regional center of crime. Thank you very much, Jeremy. I know it is uncomfortable. Oh, we are going to uh, go move on with Veronica Subiraga. Hi. I wanted to start by saying thank you, of course, the invitation to participate in this encouraging uh, conference and the political and urban faculty studies of uh, uh, Rosario University, uh, Irene Tickner, of course. And as of the question that this panel proposes, I organized my presentation precisely thinking about the relationship between the state and the criminal organizations in Caracas, focusing on Caracas. And I wanted to just share some thoughts that are in the midst of developing through this uh, research that we're doing currently through remote means or sometimes with a face to face meeting, keeping, of course, biosecurity safety rules. So I wanted to start with a, a, a perception, a view, which is the decrease of violent um, deaths in the country. And it's also because of this, the official statistics of the Ministry of the Interior and of Justice, as well as the statistics presented by um, the Lab of Social Sciences, led by Roberto Vicente. There is a decrease of homicides in the country. In 2017, we had 14,000 murders. In, in 2019, 5,500. 5, so why the decrease? Of course, there have not been any public policy to face this situation. So how does one explain this decrease in homicide? And in this way, I wanted to um, focus myself or concentrate myself on four tendencies that we're going to uh, cover here in this presentation. A very important element in the lethal violence by the police starting in 2015 with the deployment of the Freedom uh, Liberation Police. And it's been a tendency to reorganize this uh, police violence, lethal this, or the FALSA, which are the special forces of the police. They exercise a lethal violence, but it's far more specific. It's more oriented. However, 
we have the decrease of resistance to authorities that they include, especially debts performed by the authorities of 4,800 in 2017 to 3,400 in 2019. However, if in 2017 these debts represented about 25% of violent death in 2019, they represented 52% of violent death. So in other words, it means that currently the special forces of the police constitute a fundamental player in the lethal action. Another tendency that is very important that we have learned, it's the reorganization of the criminal world in Caracas. If before, in all the areas of, um, towards the south, everything which are, what are the outskirts, the, the 206 El Valle, and all this array of boroughs that the police forces call the corridors of death, if before they were constituted by little gangs that had uh, fights among themselves. Today they have become a block, an alliance block, and they constitute a very large gang that's very well constituted by about 300 members. By a clear work division, even with sections of uh, accountants, people destined for relationships and pro the community, that on the one hand. Another tendency that we have observed is precisely the association between state agents with the organized armed groups to guarantee the governance and the order in areas of difficult access. Here we have, as Jeremy would be mentioned, a whole array of armed players that, that the state has this different types of relationship with it. They have the criminal gang, as I said, with which the state, as of the year 2017, uh, had some agreement, some alliances to guarantee local security. Then we have the collectives, but the collectives is a very, very diffuse one. There are some collectives that we can call them insurgents with the very ideological discourse defending the revolution, strongly armed, implied in illicit economies like racketeering to merchants, food distribution. Then we have other collectives that we could cl classify them more as vigilantes, and they're actually fighting against crime, like three roots or tres raíces, and they wish to collaborate with sectors of the police, like the spies. So in other words, the board of a collective, like three roots or tres raíces, it is intrinsically tied to a special division of the police. I know I'm running out of time. I'm going to go to the fourth and, and last tendency, which is, as a matter of fact, is actually controlling the people. They control the people with these groups in their territory. So we have, on the one hand, in the areas where you have the criminal gangs, there's a clear governance where the neighbors refer to people like Koki uh, as the minister which is an intermediary to receive state aid, like toy distribution, food distribution, and there's clearly a regulation of social life. People speak of the gang as the tribunal. So in other words, domestic violence can be filed with them and they will impart justice, so to speak. And lastly, the armed collectives as well as the criminal gangs have been co-participants in enforcing this confinement intermittently. When the pandemia started, they would force neighbors to use their um, face masks and they would go to the stream that they would shoot those who would not follow confinement. In the case of the borough of 23 de Enero, where four people who were playing dominoes and were not using their face masks, they were shot for that. And I leave it there so that, that we can continue with the other commissions. Thank you very much, Veronica. So now we will go and listen, please, to... Um,
Wilfredo, tienes el micrófono apagado. Wilfredo, you have your mic off. I had, had not listened. Okay, thank you very much. Buenos días a todos. Good morning, everyone. Just a moment. Sue, thank you very much for the invitation to the University of Rosario, Inside Crime. Thank you very much. Thank you, our colleagues. I believe that mainly specifically regarding the border, there hasn't been, there is no, and there will not be an effective control on behalf of the Colombian authorities and the Venezuelan authorities. Well, historically, it has happened, for example, from the Observatory of Human Rights, we monitor from the 90s situations of uh, permanent uh, criminality. Likewise, we have found presence of the ELN all along the border since the end of the decade of the 70s. The presence. Hello, he said. Thank you very much. So regarding the presence of narco traffic, we have found that since uh, midst of the decade of the 80s, when the cartel of the North of Valley starts using the route of Venezuela through a uh, fictitious export of orange uh, in Cucuta, likewise the presence of the different guerrillas since the beginning of the decade of the 80s, and after that, later the paramilitary. So the border and the criminal activities in the uh, Colombian Venezuelan border has been for more than 30 years. It is not a recent phenomena, and it cannot be read as uh, facts that have appeared recently in the border and both countries. The second I'd like to point out is that all these stru illegal structures, criminal structures that generate bi violence in the uh, border are Colombian structures, the paramilitarism, uh, guerrillas, narco traffic, uh, the uh, government called uh, criminal gangs and uh, gangs following the paramilitarism, they generate violence. Those are Colombian groups that continue using the Venezuelan territory to accomplish their objectives. Now. Since 2015, for us, it is an important point. Why? It is the closing of the decision on the border, the migration crisis. So here, what we see in the last five years is what we have called uh, criminal anarchy. Not only these structures, criminal structures are present and they have spread the presence in the territory, but they, there have appeared new ones. They, we didn't know 10 years ago the, of the presence of local gangs, that is the border. Those gangs belong to the department, some of the cities of, uh, in Cucuta with organized structures and levels of uh, violent generation without precedence. So what we want to point out is it is important to see the context of violence that is taking place and all these criminal phenomena that uh, my colleagues have pointed out because regarding criminality, violence, illegality doesn't come from uh, nothing. We have processes that we have called the institutional absence of the Colombian border. And we from Progresar Foundation, uh, a couple of years ago, we checked out the uh, accord signed between the governments of Venezuela and Colombia in the late la last 40 years. We didn't find any, uh, not one accord that takes into account the situation of the border in terms, social terms, economic, economic terms, and security terms. We didn't find any uh, agreement. They took into account the inhabitants of the border. Any space we found of high level created by both countries where there was a participation of the citizenship, citizens of the border, where we uh, stated the border we dreamt of and the government we wanted. I want to close by pointing out that the responsibility of what's going on in our border is this uh, criminal anarchy, these illegal monies 
uh, generated by a border in, in the hands of the criminals, it's responsibility of an absence of a serious policy of borders, either from Caracas and Bogota as well. Thank you very much. And thank you also for respecting time. So, so now let's listen to Nelson and then we're going to uh, open up some space for Q&A and then the, each of the guest speakers will have some time to uh, present more clarify part of their presentation. Right, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm going to uh, go quickly through some slides about those illicit economies that are generating the greatest profits. And we're going to be making a, a bit of emphasis on what has to do with the border states. So the first is the increase of people trafficking, and especially in the Caribbean coast towards Curacao and Aruba and towards Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, passing out through the Delta and Sucre, and this is not foreign to the borders of Colombia, the northern part of Sulia, and and the, the part of Táchira. Also, we have a part of Apure in people trafficking, per se, as such, and lower in Bolivar with Brazil that we're going to see in all the slides because of the illegal activity of illegal mining with the Garimpeiros in Brazil um, and the criminal gangs that have actually resulted there. Another important thing is that the gasoline traffic it has had a strong uh, sort of setback in the influx in terms of gasoline to the country before we had an extraction one uh, there's now the price the hike in this matter has actually made it the now it changes thoroughly as to what is the tide of how smuggling flows and now it goes back to front from colombia into venezuela after that, we have those uh, blue circles that you see there. It's liquid gas. There is a huge shortage of liquid gas, which is making them to import and to smuggling a gas in, uh, um, in bottles and in Brazil and Bolivar. This is one of the headlines that we're accustomed to see these topics. These are illicit economies around fuel and so on, and things that just as basic as actually making a tiny lab of refining gasoline up to actually the participation of the Venezuelan state in participating in the mafias and so on. Different mafias smuggling these fuel of the energy. Another one is of extraction of, is this, the theft of cattle. Actually, they inundate several border markets with smuggling of uh, beef whether they are good or not, the, the cattle is actually raised in Venezuela and crosses the border without the market. Once they get into the border, it's marked to towards Colombia, and then it goes to their slaughter. Then we have um, dairy products as well for so many years because in Venezuela we have a price control for dairy, and since it's not like that in Colombia, well, they're sold. Uh, they, they get their value uh, to, to be sold in Colombia. Another thing is the mineral extraction that has been taking. They're all illegal mining. We have iron through the delta towards Sri and Tobago, aluminum and copper through Sucre, junk, uh, steel from Carabobo. Actually, it's come there. They go, it goes pregnant, is so they call, because they have some junk metal with drugs and so on. Another product that we need to ship out in Falcon, you have aluminum and copper that goes to Aruba and Curacao and in the border is coal time and junk through Apure and the, the patch that they're smuggling through. It's the same, the same holds true for gold, gold that comes from certain mine, mines that you have in Merida and sometimes is actually exported backwards. You have to understand that some of these criminal structures are understand that the government is paying these criminal structures for the all the, that gold ends up being at the border and then it's exchanged in Cucuta by transfer, whether in dollars or in any other type of currency abroad. So with, since the gold is being shipped out, 
to, to Aruba, Curacao, San Vincent, and the Granadines, then to be uh, as a, stop, a stepping stone for international uh, commerce. In Trinidad and Tobago, they use it there because they use the rivers throughout the Orinoco actually up to the Caribbean, and there they get to Trinidad and Tobago. Weapons smuggling has been another fundamental increase now in as far as the tendencies of this year. Last year, they were actually were having weapons imports, and, and you have had now the amount there, and there is a power struggle to controlling weapon smuggling. It's actually from Falcon to the Dutch Caribbean, to Trinidad and Tobago. There's another interesting market there. We have in Monaga and Zulia, and we're seeing San Cristobal as well, to traffic or to smuggle weapons and Roraima towards Brazil. Here we have an interesting case, which is the case of Maloca, it's, it's an aircraft with Venezuela uh, license. It had not bought legally and had weapons there to be brought here to Venezuela. And there was some munition that was coming in a container in Puerto Cabello. And one of the images that you have there on the red table where you also had weapons in that container and it was seized. Another interesting factor um, and no less important is the smuggling of cocoa. They are taking it out of the province of Sucre and of Tachira, and they have found there in Holland, and they've looked at the denomination of origin of the cocoa, and they have actually passed it there from any other country. So I think it's important that we see Tachi, the province of Tachira, as a case study. These were the flows of merchandise, all smuggled gasoline, drugs, gas, and food into Venezuela. And from Venezuela, you have people trafficking weapons, uh, cocoa, and cattle. And these, each one of these circles is kind of the size of the market. And we've actually tried to map in the province of Tachira. These are relative sizes around that circle that you see of Tachira. You have irregular groups that have the greatest presence there, especially the ELN that is actively participating in each one of these illicit activities. We estimate that there are, there are about 1,500 troops of the ELN only in Táchira controlling in all these illegal activities that government is carrying out. And even they actually take care of the distribution of, of basic services like gas utilities, gasoline distribution, and they use a clap through the coordination of these food subsidized elements that the ELN distributes to the people. The trends that we are seeing here that is coming from 2019, but now it's becoming consolidated in 2020, is actually to have the uh, marine salt there for the air detection to facilitate drug trafficking. We've actually seen a significant moment in drug trafficking. There has been a significant increase, not only in drugs, but also in seizure increase in weapon smuggling and in seizures. We have increase in extortion or racketeering and the threats that we have had before, that before they only had a threat, now they're more real. We have seen cases in Lara and Carabobo where the people that do not uh, pay uh, racketeering or, or they don't pay extortion, they're, they're at attacked with grenades. And something that we see with great uh, concern is actually the proliferation of coyotes to smuggle people across the border. And we're seeing that these activities would possibly extend throughout 2021, seeing that uh, there is a, a, a shutting of the border from Venezuela to Colombia. And here we have some headlines based on all these tendencies. And the most important of all, which is one of the strongest of them, is that we now have members of the uh, National Guard actively collaborating with drug trafficking, turning off the raiders so that they can allow flights over where the raiders should cover and uh, boats are there. I'll leave it there and so on. Thank you very much, Nelson. So we will now continue this and we will now continue with the next uh, round. Uh, so uh, let's going to do now uh, a, a few comments in respect of all these. Uh, all these four presentations that we have had there so I'm going to give 
each guest speaker five minutes so that they will respond and uh, mention the points uh, and uh, we're going to then go to Q&A um, and that we have from the floor. So firstly, Nelson touched it a bit, but I think that it would be interesting to see precisely uh, what does, uh, what do the military have to do? What is their role to go more in depth and what the role the military are playing in all of this that you will have, uh, have described to us because um, there are, and I think that it was Jeremy who spoke of it, there are some levels of corruption that are extremely high. And I would say that that would be a very important player uh, to see all of this. And the other thing, it would be how or what are you, or what are the scenarios that you see in the short term in the respect of this, in respect of the topic of the border, and which would be some of the proposals that we could have. And, for example, Arlene asked, in respect of the absence that we had of what the border mentioned this, the absence of minimal agreements between Colombia and Venezuelan government to control these situations, especially at the border, what measures do you have to, to tackle or to face or to confront this, to, to kind of foresee what the future would look like? And I think it would be important, Nessun touched it a bit, but I mean, to broaden more the meaning of, of what is the mining um, cross-reach and our lead would ask of this Arco Minero or mining uh, overreach that has empowered certain groups. So these would be like the three preliminary comments. You would have five minutes and I wish that you would stick to your five minutes so that we can go to the next session and to the participants. So I give the floor in the same order. Thank you very much. Very interesting, all the presentations. I believe that it is uh, very difficult nowadays to underestimate the importance of the organized crime and the uh, criminal monies in the survival of Maduro's regime. And understanding the power structure that Venezuela has currently Chavez left a regime almost Praetorian. He, as ex official of the army, he promoted military officials in almost all uh, bodies of the state. Maduro doesn't have the same experience, neither the same uh, loyalty level within uh, the army. So somehow he has tried to weaken the military monopoly in some aspects of the government and diversify the power in the hands of other actors, including non-state groups and criminal groups. This process of change in power in Venezuela has been accelerated by the uh, rupture of the states that have changed the bankruptcy of the state that has changed the dynamics in uh, uh, the turmoil of Chavez, all the funds and uh, the sponsorship came from the president and the oil state profit. And that profit is scarce currently, so Maduro can't even pay the state payroll, the monthly payroll. So the central power of executive is dilute, diluted and the dependency on the criminal profit with the sanctions from the United States have delivered more power to criminal elements. Maduro cannot finance directly the governors and some elements of the state, particularly at a department or state level in Venezuela. He has delivered the rights to some of the most important elements of 
uh, people who support Chavez to gather all the profit, criminal profit in an area. And the best example is Freddy Bernal in Táchira as the uh, uh, pro protectorate of Táchira. He has created a new collectivo, the uh, Border Security Colectivo, working with the ELN. He has tried to capture many of the criminal uh, profit that many others have mentioned to ensure that a percentage of that comes in the arcs of the state to keep the survival and to uh, purchase freedom of elements from the military and the regime. All of that uh, has provided with a fertile land for all kinds of criminals. We in, have profiled and followed up 32 sophisticated uh, structure of uh, organized crime divided in several groups. There is the colectivos that have been mentioned, the Colombian guerrilla, the uh, narcotraffic groups, the mega band, mega gangs, and the ones uh, in jails. And these unions, uh, related to gold. Every time this regime goes on, every day the sanctions minimize the legal income of the Venezuelan state. Maduro has to deliver influence and power to criminal elements and the uh, people who support Chavez they have to uh, partner with criminal elements to survive and keep loyalty of their basis. This relationship between organized crime and Maduro's regime are criminal political nexus. They are uh, deepened and radically is part of the structure of power in Venezuela today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeremy. So we are going to go on with Veronica. I wanted to point out that in 2015, 2014-2015, it's a milestone in this history of a criminal world organization. We have first the decrease of the prices of oil that are uh, the increase, brutal decrease of profit and the system of distribution on which Charismo was based uh, in the previous period. So then in 2015, there is the launch of the uh, freedom operations of the people, the ONP to control uh the discomfort and this world that was becoming visible in 2015 we have a peak of crime like uh, kidnapping uh, massive kidnapping of vehicles with these gangs in the uh, central south area the operation of liberation of the con of the peoples generates uh, um, jail punity in a context of police reform. They launched parallelly the Bidice operation in 2010 that generates uh, the massive jail and generates a creation of the jail gangs that are organized. But since 2015, the OLP, the uh, operation of liberation for the peoples that generates the alliance of the criminal world. At the same time, we need to take into account that we are speaking about a state that is profoundly fragmented. We have the idea that, of course, when we speak about persistence the, of the current government, it is an authoritarian state. We have the idea of this, but when we you dig down is a fragmented state, you can see 
day after day, the fight, the armed fights, even between sections of the police, the uh, CIPC is uh, facing the uh, action, special actions of the police. So it is a state that is deeply fragmented. And with this starting of alliances of, ba of gangs in 2017, it's a year that is profoundly and existentially complicated for the government. It's a year where we live four months of protests uh, the core of which 124 people died. And we had as well the question of the assembly, the elections linked to the constituent national assemblies that there was a scarcity of leg legitimacy that was profound. And at the moment facing the increase of power of criminal gangs when they start uh, making pacts and alliances between sectors of state and criminal gangs. Nevertheless, this fragment implies that despite they have the agreement, at the same time, intermittently, we see uh, fights and armed fights between the sections of the police and the criminal gangs. So to finish, There is evidence of this relationship of associations and alliances between the state and the armed groups, but these kinds of relations are different. The relationship between criminal gangs, it's a, a relation of pact or alliance for the power. Gangs have contact with intermediate base organizations like the uh, community councils and the group that uh, uh, distribute food, but there is the criminal gangs uh, haven't penetrated the state. Those are different actors and they act in alliances. Other kind of relationship, other history is with some kinds of colectivos. There are the most traditional collectivos, the strongest ones, like for example, La Quiebrita, Alexis Vives, for these kinds of uh, collectivos, there is clear relationship of collaboration. There is something in Venezuela that is important. It's about food in a country where, according to the works of the uh, University Católica, 90% of the population have difficulty to access food. In fact, the distribution and control of food has become fundamental element in these flows of trafficking and uh, uh, fundamental element for the control of the population. So regarding this clearly in uh, the areas under these collectivos, clearly they are distributing, they have the control of food and to finish all the kind of relationship are kept with colectivos such as Tres Raices, where there is an integration between this group and the, um, uh, poli uh, the police. Thank you very much, Veronica. So, yes, I have connection again, internet connection again. So Wilfredo, please, for you to answer to the questions. Thank you very much. We have found that in the last 30 years, the condition of the border has a direct relationship with uh, the appointment of uh, increase of violence, uh, criminality and the armed conflict in Colombia. So even we notice the periods, for example, where, where we have signed uh, peace accords, like the two last ones, in 2014 with the disarmed of the Catatumbo block of the uh, Autodefensas Unidas de Colombia or 2016 with FARC. So even those moments uh, have been reflected in the uh, criminality dynamics in the border. They have had important decrees, but with the rearm of the successors group, we see the kind of uh, criminality and violence. We, I say this because we have found that 421 kilometers of the north of Santander 
with the border in Venezuela, we have found that they operate 12 armed illegal structures that exercise territorial control and con social control and capture of illegal profit that generated 22 illegal activities practiced in the north of Santander border in Venezuela, with Venezuela. As previously, we have heard all these crime, criminal crimes that operate in Venezuela in the border. They have operated historically in the region. In 2015, the closing of the border and the migration uh, crisis empowers the criminal structures like the network of uh, people trafficking or illicit trafficking, but historically we have lived that here in the border. But we always uh, see that in a sense from Colombia to Venezuela, the migration crisis marks a milestone that it is from Venezuela to Colombia. Secondly, I'd like to draw your attention surrounding the uh, issue of the corruption that generates these structures and criminal activities that operate with impunity in both sides of the border. We have a binational corruption. We can, the public powers on both sides of the border live with a crime. They are accomplice of violence and they profit from the legal profit. So we need to pay everyone on the other side side of the border in Venezuela. We need to pay everyone on the other side of the Colombian border. So here, corruption is not different, doesn't have any ideology or nationality. We don't know what's worse, if the uh, public officials in Venezuela or the public officials in Colombia. Third, I'd like to point out how in the cities, in the region in general, uh, there is an increase to answer the question of the, about the scenarios. We have seen an increase of a movement of pressure towards the national Colombian government to open the border. We have insisted in some spaces where we have been that it is not enough to open only the border. It is necessary to take measures towards stopping criminality in the border. This has to do with this criminality since those are criminal structures that have been for decades, they spread, they shrink, they have peaks and drops according to the decisions they make in Venezuela or made in Colombia or the dyna criminal dynamics like the decision of the ELN to uh, have hegemony control in the border, total control of the border in the north of Santander, Venezuela has led them to uh, clash against the rastrojos or the gaitanistas. So to finish, what has been forecasted in the region is the need to recover a minimum of dialogue with the Venezuelan government. There is no possibility that we recover the border from the hands of the criminal hands if we have the scenarios of zero dialogue and debate between the governments. Thank you very much, Wilfredo. I believe that uh, Francine's, Francine's connection, we lost uh, Francine's connection, so I'm going to interact while she recovers the connection. I will give the floor to Nelson. Thank you, Arlene. Well, to answer some of the questions in the chat, first uh, about well, the uh, police and military structure of the state it is obviously all the illicit communities and these economies exist and they work thanks to the participation or omission from the state. We need to be clear saying that the uh, force of state is applied only when uh, there is a state groups out of the business of these illicit economies. They asked about the destination of the arms in Venezuela, we know there was an exchange of guns between the PCC of Brazil and Tren de Aragua in the Brazilian border. The guns of Venezuela are come from uh, military, uh, the military and the police. Those guns, we don't know the destination in Colombia. We have been monitoring the flow of guns, war guns considered here in Venezuela, like R-15 assault automatic guns in the border 
but still we are not clear the final destination of these guns in Colombia. And somebody asked about the specialization of armed groups in uh, works and criminal economies, particular. There are groups that are specialized. We had a long time ago the routes they used, uh, the ELN and FARC to transport drug from the uh, Colombian border to the Caribbean border in Venezuela, the same routes used now on the, uh, the watch of these armed groups and other criminal structures that are smaller to be able to uh, uh, smog smuggle with uh, minerals. Mainly, we have seen how the ELN and FARC, they deliver support to move the minerals through the roads they had established. I don't, let me just, check out the questions a little bit more. Here they speak about a statement on the uh, Dutch uh, Caribbean. We speak about Aruba and Curaçao, the commercial exchange, trade exchange of uh, illicit mining uh, from my mines, or there is a phenomenon that is the uh, stealing of cables and uh, material. This is illegal and from a small uh, fishing boats that are loaded of uh, a cable, copper, aluminum that is smuggled illegally to Aruba and Curaçao. And uh, after that is sold to international markets. Some cases we have established a connection with uh, junk sales to uh, China, where they sell, they buy, purchase these minerals, uh, copper, aluminum. I'm missing another one, copper, aluminum, and uh, iron in junk, but I will just uh, check that out for a concrete uh, answer. Arlene. I will answer some of the questions in the chat because we have broad topics. It is difficult to answer that in only one answer. Fortunately, with our uh, surgical handling of time, we have a lot of time to take uh, the rest of questions from our attendees. I'll try to organize some of them and give the floor to the ones who would like to answer them. There are general questions that I think are interesting. One has to do with the association, the transition of the current regime and the end of organized crime, meaning we have the feeling when we hear, hear the presentations that simply with a political transition in Venezuela, the problem of organized crime somehow, crime somehow will be controlled. So the relationship between the change of regime and uh, the mitigation of organized crime, how you see that it is a question. Another one has to do with the accomplice of the government, the countries to which all the different smuggling is uh, shared to. So we speak in general about a situation of uh, institutional weakness uh, in Venezuela and Colombia. We could uh, have the same statement about most of the other countries that are involved in these networks that Nelson has described. So if there is any evidence on uh, accomplice and high degree of corruption in these places, that would be a second question. And a third question, I will leave it there for another round, has to do with proof, evidence of presence of uh, criminal Mexican gangs from Raul Benitez, Mexico, in the border between Venezuela and Colombia. I will uh, leave you to choose who would like, maybe you, Nelson, 
you have the floor first and then I go back to Jeremy. Then I have a specific question for Veronica for the next round, specifically the change of uh, the policy and criminal groups. Venezuela has to uh, undergo a reinstitutionalization process. Here, the intermission in this illicit economy of military gangs and policy uh, police groups pro makes it proliferate and be profit profitable and they operate with uh, the blessing of the government so there is if there is a change of regime political change you have to reinstitutionalize military forces you would have Venezuela to be able to have a new police structure that inspires respect through uh, effective public policies to try to dismantle these illegal uh, policies. So we do not believe this is going to happen overnight. Speaking to specialists regarding this, they say in the base of cases that everything uh, squares up perfectly, efficiently, in a minimum of six months, there will be a change in the first institutions of the country we don't trust in these periods i think it is an overestimation in the capability of change that is so fast we feel that not everybody with the main players political players of the country they are not clear on the magnitude of these criminal structures and the magnitude of the criminal economies which finance these groups of course a change would change a little bit of base of the criminal structures, not completely. These, they would stop operating with um, the support of the uh, state. Uh, they would be more covered, less public, less known, like they are doing now. Veronica, I'd like to ask you if there's anything that you'd like to add to that uh, question in particular. Yes, no doubt. I appreciate the question because it is true that uh, we uh, did a diagnosis of the situation and it is necessary to uh, think of the solution. We, some scholars, journalists, researchers, activists, we think of and we advocate for the need uh, to start to get ready for transitional justice processes in our country that implies uh, accompanying internationally uh, fundamental international company accompaniment to deploy the program with impartiality of a serious investigation of crimes but not only since 1999 we need a long-term view to think and debate on the origin of the political conflict in venezuela in 1958 could be a good date, 1989, with the Caracas, an important date. But no question, the start a process to look for the truth supported by the institution, as Nelson said, to modify and transform the institution and, of course, the police. Some changes that we have in the horizon is how, like in Salvador, it was the seas of war, but the organized crime continued to spread. So regarding this, it is urgent to start dialogue processes and profound conversations inspired by the Colombia model when we think of all the fine architecture of uh, restoration justice in the framework of peace accords. Jerry, I'll give you the floor, but I'll add to these questions an additional one that is linked to the question on transition. And the question is about if there is a scenario in which the organized crime could uh, stop depending on Ma Maduro and look for the transition aimed at uh, ma ma making up differently with the absence of the regime just to add to the mix of all the questions i launched i believe 
that we need to think of the nature of the regime, the change of regime. We have had some uh, examples of the attempt of assassinating uh, Maduro with Gideon operation. We need to remind that in the last 20 years, the Venezuelans have been bombarded with propaganda saying the gringos want to steal the oil. So I believe that there is a real threat of a Bolivarian resistance. If there is a sudden change of government or you see the hand of the United States in that, for me, that is the worst of all the scenarios. The worst, even the current conditions after living for 20 years in Colombia, I have seen how difficult it is to finish a civil conflict and how easy it is for the organized crime to use the political facade to camouflage their activities and use the ideology to recruit, protect their business, etc., etc. When we saw the groups that have uh, are the advocates of the Bolivarian regime and Maduro's regime, how the like colectivos and ELN statements and the guerrilla, the Fuerzas de Liberación Libera, uh, Bolivarianas, there is a possible alliance of some of these groups that could. Uh, provide resistance or a Bolivarian insurgents. The organized crime went to uh, feed that scenario, like we have had in Colombia, because it is the best. If they cannot control the state, the way they are controlling the state at the moment, the second option is to create a conflict where they can operate without much impunity, without impu with impunity. So about the Mexicans, we haven't seen permanent presence, but there are buyers, intermediary from Mexican group trying to ensure loads, shipments and the flow of cocaine towards Mexico and their um, main market in the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Wilfredo, would you like to add any comment? And I will add another question for you to add to your answer. I know the answer, but I will leave you the answer. Either you or other organizations have uh, complained on the corruption actions that you have mentioned in your presentation, or it is just your comment. Can you answer that question? Thank you, Arlene. Yes, we have uh, even gone beyond. We have proposed a national government to intervene the Metropolitan Police and intervene in general, the uh, public uh, force in our department that is for because of the uh, corruption levels. Many of the scenarios that we participate of interinstitutional debate, we uh, see the topics, but the cases, our uh, work of Progresar Foundation Observatory is a 30 years work detailed. We have enough information with organizations and communities that allow us to access not only the general information, but also to accompany the cases of a human rights violation that happened in the border. I will comment quickly on two issues. The accomplice of the countries, neighbor, neighbor countries, what I believe is personally that at least in the last two governments, half of the government Santos, what has happened in Duque's government, there is no will to recover the border. I believe the current government is interested that the criminal anarchy, the violent anarchy, all those activities and criminal structures operate in the border because this is a government and I want to finish here, not to involve the political issue of Colombia. This is a Colombia supported by the enemy of terrorism and war and narco traffic and they are interested in the anarchy that we have now in the border to sustain 
this political discourse. The uh, third point I wanted to touch upon is the presence of Mexican people in the territory in 2012. In 2012, the CETAS, they start being in the government through intermediaries. They sent the money and there was a person from uh, now and then to check, monitor, and they sent the money to Colombian narcos and local narcos too, to Creole narcos that were in charge of buying the uh, dove of coca in the Catatumbo. The Zetas leave the territory due to some situations that, including Venezuela, they deliver a member of a group of uh, uh, drug dealers in the territory captured in Venezuela. It is set free and delivered to the DEA and it uh, generates uh, a flea in the region. But in 2018, we have the presence of the Cartol de Sinaloa and Sinaloa changes the handling of the setas because there was problem how the setas handled the business. They lost money, the uh, coca dove and the um, uh, stuff was bad quality, it was delayed. So the Sinaloa cartel sends people from Sinaloa here to the north of Santander. And what happened in last year is the presence of uh, the cartel of Jalisco, new generation. These Mexican structures don't have an armed structure. They do not generate massacre, they do not slaughter. They have a security structure to move money. money Currently, the Jalisco Cartel New Generation, the Cartel of Sinaloa, are the big buyers of Dove of coca leaf generated in Catatumbo, and the movement of cash in the uh, territory have enormous dimensions, thousands of thousands of kilos produced in Catatumbo that we have calculated quickly, 150,000 kilos every three months produced in the region, and that is cash made by the Mexican cartels. Thank you, Wilfredo. I will try to focus a set of questions to be able to take practically all of the ones I have been able to make, to ask uh, two groups of questions. Since we have eight minutes, I will leave you choose a group of questions that I think very important to answer have to do with the composition, the character of the criminal gangs that operate in Venezuela. Here, simply I will read the ones I've been able to analyze. First, we have to speak of sectorial groups that manage expertise in specific areas or are these territorial groups that exercise territorial control and handle multiple sectors and illicit business, when Jerry speaks about these criminal gangs that are more like criminal kingdoms and so on. What does this mean about criminal kingdoms? Are we talking about exchange processes and criminal ones in terms of a territory, a mixture of these uh, things, or is this something different? And in the specific case of Veronica, I would like to give you the opportunity to go more in depth of the case of Caracas, how many gangs are we talking about? How do they operate? Because they have, we have had several questions in that respect. The second uh, bulk of these things that I want to emphasize this, that I want to think about is actually around solutions. The situation in the border seems not only complex, but actually very bleak to, to face uh, this, to use a pessimistic uh, adjective if the diplomatic circle, the uh, sanctions, international sanctions are there, have they had an effect? Are there any alternatives of these policies? If the OAS should have a role or not, and how would that role be? And in the absence of these mechanisms that, that have worked or not, are there any other ways out that one were to foresee to the current crisis? that we're having to face in the country as well as in the border. Uh, I'm going to follow that in the order that we, we did. So Jerry, please go first. Right, so um, very well. Um, I want to be quick here, you know, uh, uh, with these questions. Uh, brief, firstly, a good chunk of the criminal yields that 
come to Venezuela are transnational. So the answer should be transnational response. And obviously Colombia, Brazil, the United States, and some of the countries in the Caribbean are the clear, absolutely key partners to the European Union because a good chunk of coca uh, uh, goes to Europe. And in respect of the UN, I would like to, I am drawn to, to, to kind of the CICIG in Guatemala. That draws my attention because really what has actually, uh, has actually undermined the state is corruption. This systematic theft of, uh, of uh, 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 the riches of the nation. And it has contributed to the failed state that we have. Another thing that I am interested in about the CICIG is that we need to uh, orient at all costs the notion of political persecution. So if we have an independent body, an international body in charge of preparing and um, progressing with corruption, much better that they do not have Venezuelan heads to avoid any accusation of uh, political persecution. And I know that in any new government, that's going to be a very sensitive element in respect of the composition and the characterization of these organized crime trades in respect of this, um, uh, these criminal gangs are actually territorial gangs that they have some influence in the municipality or the train of Aragua, the ELN and the FARC that actually has present in many Venezuelan states. And also there we have to um, divide between the ones that actually are specialized in some type of crime, drug trafficking, uh, smuggling, extortion, and the ones that are independent who are acting within the Venezuelan state, like the uh, cartel of the uh, top brass. Uh, that we have to be in Chavez. So the only thing that we can say is that uh, never have we seen in Latin America a growth of organized crime that has been so fast that we have seen in the last 20 years in Venezuela that before they did not have organized crime. All organized crime was Colombian. So now we have Venezuelan groups that are transnational groups. And we believe that if they continue in this way, in the next five years, we're going to have within the criminal power next to the Colombians, Brazilians, and Mexicans, Venezuelan uh, criminal gang groups. Thank you very much, Jerry Veronica. Right, so I'm going to answer these questions about criminal gangs in Caracas and um, concentrating in this big band that is there from the center towards the entire periphery in the Southland that is called the, the Koki Gang or the Corridors of Death that is so-called. Um, the information there by consensus is that we have around some 300 men or troops that are divided in 36 different sectors. So each there are three large leaders, but the gangs are sector by sector. And there has been this huge alliance, paradoxically, with other military operations. What they did is generate or the, a great alliance between the different gangs to face an answer to the war declared by the state since the year 2015. On the other hand, definitely it's a territorial control, but there is an array of criminal activities that vary between illicit and illicit ones. For example, a collective one like Alexi Bido has activities of bakeries, they have greenhouses, the cultural group of women that they organize activities with women, they have a discourse and a doctrine of left and supporting government, but at the same time they have an armed a group uh, and, and they have criminal activities such as the 
food control, torsion, casinos. There's a whole set of activities that go between the legal and illegal there. Clearly, three routes there. Very important ones of the group that are tied to the police and they participate jointly in the military operations of the fires, specifically in killing Oscar Pierce that is filmed the entire event but there are three routes that they actually have a control that is very rooted in what is food distribution for example the clap bags which is the fundamental policy to distribute food they receive them that distribute certain products amongst the street uh, sales people what they actually get they get food bags with very little resources and I'll stop there to respect. And thank you very much here. And then we have here, we have the time that it's not a problem that if we extend ourselves a couple of few minutes to be able to hand over the mic to Nelson and Wilfred. I'm going to give it to Nelson because I see that his, he has his, his uh, mic and his activity. Yes, very quickly to touch a bit of, of, of touching you of Jeremy said, criminal structure, we're seeing him in Venezuela. It is a phenomenon that also dates very recently in the same structure that proved to be effective in controlling prisons. We see that those are the ones that were created in the Paranato. These inter-jail ones of power were actually were teaching the criminal gangs that were as soon as they spin off some of these jails to the society of the new inserted, they continue with the criminal activity and they broaden the control areas and their activities of the jails to other sectors. The jails definitely in Venezuela are one of the main ones there that we can have to have some sort of crime and they're more than jails, they're actually schools of crime where the people who participate that are sent to the jails actually end up graduating with a PhD in criminal activities and handing crim uh, illicit activities. And now they're talking about the sanction and the effectiveness of the foreign ones. The sanctions have worked actually to block specific people that one way or another facilitate financing channels or payment channels for government as such in purchasing goods and services in a very international spectrum of acquiring those goods and services for them. Now the sections actually have actually to cut off these oxygen lines, but the government at the same time has been very effective in regenerating new mechanisms to find their own financing. Among them, they have the generation and the participation, each one of these illicit activities that we mentioned before, and also in the generation of new characters, front men that replaced the previously sanctioned people. We saw how that happened with the case of Samar Lopez, after Samar Lopez that is actually sent, then we have Alex Saad, after Alex Saad now they begin to find a new character who could actually do the financing of the government to find the procurement and acquisition of goods and services in different countries that they would not be able to do it through the traditional ones, traditional bridges that they have had with the United States or countries in the region. Thank you very much, Nelson. Wilfredo, do you have anything that you wish to add in one minute? Well, I just wish to point out a bit to answer to the topic of the character of this group, of these criminal gangs, especially of what they have there. And then we have their uh, diversity. They generate their own dynamics, but in general, the characteristics is that they exercise ter 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 territorial control, social control, to be able to capture illegal profits. Many of them, they concentrate there. At some point in time, they make an alliance or they declare wars, as was mentioned of the ELN, against the paramilitary groups of the Rastrojos. But what actually draws the attention is that even local gangs that started with three brothers trying to extort in a neighboring borough in Cucuta, and then five years later, they have a gang of 150 troops La Linea, they actually would cut up people, they do express kidnappings, and they would do it in plain daylight with total impunity from the Venezuelan authorities and the Colombian authorities, because that is the other characteristics that I, with this I wish to close, and that is that these operations are back and forth. They use the Venezuelan territory, but they also use the Colombian territory. The Venezuelan pushes out the rest of after they had settled 
in Boca Negrita and Europa with more than 300 armed troops, uh, a structure in an extraction process in Venezuela. And into the metropolitan area, now we have an area that our dimensions on stop violence because they're trying to grow all those our military structures that had there in Bucarita, Europe, and Serbia is now operating in the metropolitan area of Cucuta. <laughs> right, thank you very much, Wilfredo. And with this, I think that we will be closing our first uh, very interesting and worrisome panel about the case of Venezuela. And there are several questions that have been unanswered that we will invite you to continue in the next tables that uh, discussion tables because in the measure that they progress we will service them especially the final discussion about the, uh, the general affectation of the organized crime due to the pandemia of COVID-19 and before we actually say goodbye I want to be thankful to Grand Cintio that had some connectivity issues and he left without knowing and Jeremy, Veronica, Wilfredo and Nelson for their participation in this table. And I would like to invite all of those who are connected to continue with us at 11.15, where we will start the next working table about uh, environmental crimes and drug traffic. And simply just to say that if you maintain to remain connected, you may do so without any problem. And if you wish to disconnect and reconnect, that is also a possibility. Thank you very much to all of you. And we will see you in less than an hour. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much and a warm hugs to all.